So today's video is a little different. Now and again I mention the deceptive fashions that have been employed to disguise transgenders um, amongst the regular people and to also make the regular people's appearances more closely approximate that of the transgenders. So I'm going to take a look at uh, the last century in fashion mostly and just talk about some of the ways that they've hidden the transgenders over time. During the Edwardian era we had fashion that was quite similar to what was worn during the Victorian era as well. So with these suits, it wasn't quite as easy to hide the uh, the FTM body because these waistcoats were very fitted to the body, the male torso, and the trousers were usually quite fitted as well. They're not as fitted as during the Georgian era, where for the gentlemen in particular, they were so tight they had to really struggle to get into them. But essentially, even though uh, the body is covered up a lot in this era, you would really notice wide hips in these kinds of uh, fitted clothing choices. And these coats as well. Though long coats, long coats do often work better in disguising uh, wider hips. So there is a possibility of the disguise of an FTM body in this time period. Now the uh, famed kind of Gibson girl look of the late Edwardian era was basically the end of a traditional feminine look. Though, during this time period, we had the wearing of corsets, which would completely alter the female uh, figure. Now, just from that standpoint, using corsets would have made it easier to disguise a male body, because you could pull on the ribcage, and uh, I believe bustles were no longer worn in the Edwardian era. The bustle was worn sporadically through the uh, Victorian era, uh, kind of piece worn underneath the dress to create a larger behind an appearance. But in the Edwardian era we had the thin waist that was pulled in at a very low level and a strange kind of shape to the torso as the body they were going for for women and that it would have been more possible to approximate for a transgendered male to female. At the same time, I don't believe they had very uh, sophisticated hormone treatments back then so the faces of cross-dressing males were typically pretty obvious. So even if you could cinch in the waist, it wasn't as easy to disguise them back then. I think that uh, in this time period, most likely we had only a few elite uh, generational Satanist families who were into uh, Baphomet worship and androgyny, and uh, they would have been the ones to do this kind of uh, cross-dressing. But as the media was not uh, in place yet properly, didn't have as much of a push from these people to get their transgenders in the public eye. This is the last decade in which it was quite strict that the females uh, wore dresses or skirts, and uh, not trousers. So there was that distinct divide between what was acceptable for male and female, and you can see all these people dressed fairly similar to uh, the earlier photos of... So the same sort of things apply to how well transgenders could have been hidden at this point. Now, some photos of people actually out in public with these kinds of with this kind of attire. Um, as mentioned, the the tighter fitting trousers meant that you really couldn't hide a female cue angle and female hips. You can see on all of these men that we have wider shoulders than you can tell where the hips are, even with these coats. So I do think it would have been fairly easy to to spot a transgender in this time period, and uh, you know with the women because of what they could do with the corsets. Same things, you know, the fitted waistcoat, the fitted trousers, you can tell with this kind of attire, would have been quite difficult for them to properly disguise a female body. That's not to say there weren't transgenders during this time period, but uh, the fashion doesn't seem to have been specifically designed for that purpose, is what I'm saying. Now here you can see, uh, in these two-piece outfits, you did have the dresses worn up high at a female waist. So, you know, I do think, aside from the face issue of uh, MTFs probably having very unpassable faces in this time period, um, you, you probably could disguise the body a little bit better. But again, I just don't believe there were as many back then as there are now. It's gradually been increasing in numbers and in popularity, and uh, has been propelled by the media and perpetualized by the media. Now, as we approached the 20s, fashion began to change a little bit. The corset was out for the first time in many centuries, and they went to another extreme where the body line was just not very feminine. Now, actually, into the 20s, 
I've mentioned this before, but they had kind of reverse corsets that they began wearing. And this was all to try and create a youthful, boy-like body line. They would compress the hips as much as possible, they would push that from the hips up into the waist, and aim for a completely straight up and down appearance. They mention that there's a bone front and an elastic back, so you can have a little bit of movement, because in this time period they had quite riotous living, and the uh, fashionable women would be dancing in clubs for hours on end. Um, you know, the Roaring Twenties was quite a wild time period. It's very interesting that that kind of social behaviour, when women began acting uh, quite outrageously, was also when they stopped trying to intensify the appearance of a female body by cinching a natural female waist in even further, as with the traditional corsets, and instead tried to get a male-looking body. Reduce it to compress everything so you don't have that pesky female figure. In addition to that uh, kind of hip reverse corset, they also had something to compress the chest, because you didn't want that unfashionable bust sticking out and ruining your board-like figure. Can't risk being out of fashion by not using these special undergarments that will create a boy-like up-and-down figure. So the uh, clothing was typically just quite a quite a boxy kind of appearance. They did attempt to eliminate the uh, female curves as much as possible. Uh, the hemline also went up in the 1920s, whereas typically it was uh, at the ankle for many centuries. And uh, women also would roll down their stockings, so the top could be seen at around the knee, which was a fashion done to shock and outrage. And any fashion that is done with that intent and purpose does not have a place in a moral society. Also here we have the cloche hats, which effectively would have disguised any kind of brow ridge you'd be seeing. Continued from the Victorian era, you also have quite a lot of uh, kind of male suit jacket designs, which were previously not worn until the Victorian era on women. The high heel became popular as well, which makes the foot appear smaller by having less of the foot actually in contact with the ground. So yes, when people were wearing these hats solo to cover their forehead and compressing the female body as much as possible, you could have very easily disguised transgenders during this time period in the female attire. The flat back is a noteworthy feature of Warren's featherbone girdle. So in transvestigating, uh, a very important thing to look out for is the female lower spinal arch and uh, a female-looking posterior. And so this kind of device attempts to fight against the female tilt to the pelvis and to compress the female rear. They were doing everything possible to completely obliterate the appearance of the female figure during this time period. Correct weight distribution. Because the way your body naturally distributes it is not correct. You want smart lines, you do not want female curves. So this is a very evil scheme that must have made countless women feel horrible about their bodies, which is something that has not ended to this day. From the fashion diagrams of the time period, you can also see that they were very much promoting the uh, straight up and down figure. And again, some women in this time period began wearing trousers now and again, typically very baggy trousers that were... Uh, sort of an intermediate between trousers and a skirt. They like to push boundaries slowly to get people used to it. And a device that keeps you fit and keeps weight off is another invention of the time period. This really speaks to the vanity and insecurity of a culture where they had enough, but it was never enough. And that's still a problem that exists today. So from the advent of advertising, they were also trying to make people feel inadequate about their bodies and feel that the way they naturally were was just not good enough. They needed devices to be beautiful. You can see there's also a man here, so it wasn't just restricted to women. In order to make money, in order to sell products and profit off of the insecurity of people, all kinds of products were promoted that preyed on the insecurity of the human mind, which is a tactic still used today in most advertising. Another distinctive change in the 1920s was the hairstyle. This is the first time in centuries that women had short hair. Now, I'm not saying that it's not okay to have short hair, but I am pointing out that historically, the standard for women in our society was long hair, and for men, it was short hair. There were time periods when men had slightly longer hair, but typically women's hair was always longer. And so to have women go to this kind of hairstyle, that's short, 
it is crossing lines, blurring boundaries, and making people no longer have the same kind of beliefs about what constitutes a female appearance and what is acceptable in female fashion. In the 1920s, they also began wearing makeup. Prior to this point, the only women who wore makeup in Western society were prostitutes. It was reported that some uh, some women in the gentry would visit salons in order to have uh, mild makeup jobs done and treatments done, but this was considered a very vain and uh, shameful thing, and so they would disguise themselves and uh, go in very in a very clandestine manner, cloaked and so forth, um, because society would frown on such a thing. But in the 1920s, it was completely embraced, and suddenly we had a lot of makeup wearing. I'm talking about, you know, commoners, the regular kind of people, because it was, um, yes, in Western society, in the early Georgian era, we did have uh, the nobility, males and females, both slathering their faces with white makeup with uh, lead in it, and a lot of rouge wearing and such. But the difference between the 1920s and all other time periods in Western society is that only the nobility or fallen women would wear makeup. So either the elite, who may have something to hide in many cases, or prostitutes. I mentioned this before in comments and otherwise, that makeup is a completely artificial device that is now part of automatic thinking that has been brainwashed and programmed into people to think that something looks female. So no matter what face you see it on, if you see this kind of makeup on a face, you're going to think it looks girly, because that's what's been taught to us by the media for generations, since the 1920s. So makeup is not feminine, there is nothing feminine about makeup, it is colours that are painted onto a face, and it is one of the many tactics they used to make females and male-to-female transgenders have something in common with each other. If everyone presenting as female had colours on their face, then people would easily believe that makeup is what would constitute a female. I'd also like to point out that the makeup in this time period was very, uh, very bold, and again, like many of the fashions of the time period, designed to kind of shock people. The very dark eye makeup, typically very red lips as well. There was a lot of reckless, prideful behaviour in this time period, and the makeup that was worn really, uh, suited the time period in that in that sense. Another thing that began being done in the 1920s was plucking the eyebrows completely and drawing them back on over top. That makes it much easier to disguise a male if you don't have male eyebrows on the face. And uh, as this became the fashion, regular women started doing it too. And so during this time period, they would have thought that drawn on eyebrows looked female no matter who had them. So they would have ignored something like, you know, a brow ridge. Because as long as there's the fake eyebrow, and then the makeup on the face, they would have thought it looked female. I've also mentioned before that typically men seem to have uh, thicker lashes than women. Eyelash length is decided by genetics, so uh, there's a gene for shorter eyelashes and one for longer eyelashes. So I'm not referring to that. But the kind of uh, thickness and overall growth of lashes tends to be more intense on males, in my observation. So I would posit that... The advent of mascara was in order to make females feel that the natural appearance of their less defined eyelashes was inadequate. And these days, um, I think you'd be quite hard pressed to find a woman who doesn't wear mascara, at least, in order to try and get this look. If you put a man and a woman next to each other, neither of them wearing mascara, typically I think you're going to find that the female eyelashes will appear slightly more sparse in comparison to the male. So this is yet another way that they were attempting to blur the boundaries between the genders. And as I was mentioning, uh, women have sparser eyelashes naturally. Even light, scant eyelashes are made to appear naturally dark, long, and luxurious. Millions of women in all parts of the world realise that this is the most important aid to beauty and use it regularly. So again, another tactic to make women feel that their natural appearance is not acceptable, not adequate. I've also mentioned before that uh, that males in any given population will tend to have a slightly darker skin tone than the women of that given population. Uh, same goes for hair. If their genes code for a certain hair colour, which is the same uh, genetic coding as a female, typically the males will appear slightly darker. This is because testosterone will darken the appearance of skin and hair. I've noticed that this also seems to extend to lip colour. So naturally on men and women, 
Typically you'll find lips being a couple shades darker than the rest of the face, because men's faces will typically be a little, be a little bit darker than women of the same population, their lips will be a little bit darker. So it's very interesting that women were being told to wear lipstick, which if you take a look at uh, the different shades typical to males and females, would be more in alignment with male lip colour. Obviously nobody has lips this red naturally, but uh, that is interesting. It seems as though wearing the mascara was in order to create a slightly more male appearance in the eyelashes, and wearing the lipstick was to create a slightly more male appearance in the lips. Now in this time period also they began wearing sleeveless tops, and uh, as mentioned the hemline of the skirts went up. So of course, big companies and corporations took the opportunity to uh, make people feel inadequate about another thing. So after centuries of doing absolutely nothing to it, women decided to remove underarm hair and leg hair. Now I want to point out that hair pattern growth is very different in males and females. If you had transgenders during this time period, and uh, you didn't have women shaving their legs, can you imagine how obvious it would have been which ones were the male ones and which ones were the females? This hair removal was the beginning of another thing, which uh, is just artificial and manufactured that we decide equals female. Uh, so it all began in the 20s, and it still exists in the modern world, that if someone's body was hairless, and if their face had makeup on, it looked female. But those are both things that can be mimicked by the opposite gender. Isn't that interesting? So from this new habit of the hair removal, as well as the body-altering reverse corsets to create a boyish body line and down to things like high heels to make the feet appear a little bit smaller you had many tactics during this time period that would have uh, effectively disguised male to female transgenders in with females compared to if they hadn't done this historically heels have been worn on women's shoes but uh, the important thing now is that the hemline has gone up so we can really see them compared to in past uh, past centuries. So as I mentioned, the largest part that's connecting with the floor creates an illusion, so the foot doesn't look quite as large to uh, anyone observing it. Also, wearing high heels will cause the pelvis to tilt at a slightly different angle, so in men uh, this wouldn't have been quite as useful during the 1920s because they were going for that completely straight male body line. But uh, in general, high heels will change the posture of a person a little bit, so um, they're effective in helping male to females appear a little bit more female in their posture and so forth. Now, hair in the 1920s for men hadn't really changed much from the last few decades. Uh, just kind of short, tidy, parted. During the 1920s, you did see something a bit suspicious in some of the kinds of trousers. They had these very puffy, they had a very puffy appearance. And I've, uh, touched on this before in other videos. See, that on the older man you still have the uh, looks of what he's wearing looking fairly similar to what you saw in the uh, in the ed end of the Edwardian era, but the younger ones, their fashion is a little bit different and uh, consists of baggier trousers. So this kind of look, this kind of look is much easier to disguise an FTM in. The suit jackets that flare out more easily would disguise the hips of a woman dressing as a man, and uh, the baggy trousers will help to disguise the wider hips as well and the uh, Q angle. That being said, it does look like these men all have very straight legs here, so you know, you could you can still tell, it's just that it, uh, it would have been less suspicious thanks to some of the fashions they were wearing that kind of blurred the barriers between what constituted female and male. The 1930s at a glance, you can uh, very much see it was just the bridging period, the intermediate between the wild, roaring 20s and the more conservative 40s. So still you have uh, quite dark eye makeup, you have the short hair that's stuck around for a few decades, and uh, the dark lipstick. So they're going to continue to employ this, this makeup that... Uh, people will now believe is what makes a female face, and that still hasn't gone away, so. They still had some of these hats, but they did away with the with the compressing of the body to try and completely obliterate a female figure. 
wasn't that they were really embracing the kind of female look, because they still had a lot of straight lines in the fashions of the 1930s. But I, I believe, as this was during a period of depression, the behaviour of the people was kind of uh, reined in a little bit. And going along with that, uh, the fashion. So the 1930s uh, toned down the behaviour of the 20s and the appearance of the 20s until we ended up in the 40s. As mentioned, the trousers that began to be worn by a few people in the 20s were also worn in the 30s. The, the baggy trousers, you know, trousers had never been worn by women before, except for a few people on the fringes in a couple of places that were notorious for doing so. But the main thing is, it was a societal change, and it just meant that uh, they were breaking down the gender barriers for what was acceptable and what would help people figure out what was male and female. So here again we are seeing that the trousers became much baggier in this time period. Now another thing, uh, you can't really tell because the uh, coats are all buttoned up, but they did wear the trousers very high, which was at about the level that a female waist indentation would be. So that meant that on FTMs, that high level where you'd find their waist indentation, their hips would expand past that point, so the baggy trousers would effectively hide that a little bit, and on men, because the trousers were baggy, it meant that their hip shape would appear more similar to the FTMs because it was just creating a puffier, more expanded appearance. So the 1930s, again, you still could have disguised some of them using this uh, method. It still is possible to tell which ones are which with some careful examination. The 1930s hairstyle really hadn't changed much from the 1920s for men. Still just fairly short, tidy, parted. And keep in mind, this isn't a video where I'm transvestigating all of the uh, people in every photo, so... Uh, whether you think that the people in the photos are not the gender they're presenting as, the point is that they are displaying the fashions of the decade, and that is their purpose here, so don't worry too much about that. This is something interesting from the 1930s. A skinny, new easy way adds 5 to 15 pounds quick. Has to be an easy way, a magical fix, just like we see in advertisements today, and it has to all be dependent on the, the female's body naturally not being good enough. So in the 1920s, they were telling people to get in shape, to stop being fat, to stop having female curves, and now they're telling them that they need them again. So what a mixed message, you know, a decade ago, everyone would have been striving to lose weight and be like a boy, and now suddenly, they wouldn't have plenty of dates, because they're not curvy. So this is kind of a push and pull that will continue for the next few decades after the 30s, um sending mixed messages to women. But the main message, the main underlying message, is that their body is not acceptable the way it is. And this was something that was really being pounded into, especially women, at this point, and they began to do the same thing to men as time went on as well. But uh, I think they started with women, because women are typically more insecure, and uh, society has a very looks-oriented uh, way of evaluating women. So. There's already a lot of sensitivity on that, and there always has been historically for women, so it's easier to kind of uh, play on that insecurity for women. So yeah, in these decades they began to make people feel inadequate about their appearance, and they began to blur the appearance of what was acceptable through changing hairstyles, through changing fashion, through uh, altering body lines drastically, through creating artificial standards that would uh, be what would define people's judgment on what uh, was correct for a gender. So that is the Edwardian era to the 1930s. And that's that.